In case you've missed it, my other channel has rebranded to Sinister. We're expanding with multiple shows, which will include Somewhere Sinister, our new show Someone Sinister, and eventually Something Sinister. You can follow the link above or in the description and check out some Sinister stories. More than four decades ago, the close-knit town of Walterboro, South Carolina was rocked by a shockingly brutal murder. Even back then, Walterboro had its fair share of small-town crimes, but the stunned residents had never seen anything like this. With a beautiful young woman dead and a killer on the loose, the otherwise friendly townsfolk became far more fearful and suspicious than they'd ever been. After all, everyone in town had to wonder if the killer was someone they knew. This is Monsters. Gwendolyn Elaine Fogel, who went by Elaine, spent the night of Saturday, May 27, 1978, babysitting for her friends Bert and Patricia Utzi. Elaine enjoyed babysitting, but she couldn't wait for the night to end because she was looking forward to driving to her parents' home in Orangeburg the following day to celebrate her mother's birthday. She hadn't seen her family in quite some time, and she particularly missed her sister, Yolene. The Utsis returned home at about 11.15 p.m., after which Elaine drove to the home that she shared with her roommate, Nancy Hooker. The house was empty when she arrived because Nancy and her friend Billy O'Brien had spent the evening at an Amway event in Conway about two and a half hours away and weren't expected back until after 2 a.m. Sometime between 11.15 and 11.20 p.m., Elaine parked her car, unlocked the front door, and entered the home. About three hours later, Nancy and Billy arrived after a long evening in Conway. Billy and Nancy both thought it was strange that the living room lights were still on since Elaine told them she planned on getting up early to drive to Orangeburg, which was about 50 miles or 80 kilometers away. On the front porch, Nancy handed Billy her house keys and he unlocked and opened the front door. The first thing they noticed was that the living room looked like it had been hit by a tornado. Lamps and knickknacks were strewn all over the floor, and a heavy end table was lying on its side by the front door. Even more shockingly, the floor, walls, and sofa were splattered with blood, and Elaine was lying face up in front of the sofa. She wasn't moving, and her face was horribly contorted like it had been frozen in place during some unbelievably horrific event. One of her feet was on the floor, but the other was in an elevated position on the couch. She was still wearing shoes, but she was naked from the waist down. Her bra and shirt were pushed up over her breasts. Her face and hair were covered with blood, and worst of all, a heavy metal fire poker was wrapped tightly around her neck. Terrified that the attacker might still be inside, Billy and Nancy ran from the home and drove to the Walterboro Police Department a mile away. They told the officers that it looked like Elaine had been beaten, raped, and strangled, but they weren't sure if she was still alive or if she was dead. Officers responded immediately but couldn't detect a pulse, and when EMTs arrived a few minutes later, they confirmed that Elaine was dead. Lead investigator Lieutenant Robert Carter assumed that the attacker was already inside when Elaine got home because the front door was locked when Billy and Nancy arrived. That was confirmed when investigators found a dining room window that had been broken from the outside. After breaking it, the perpetrator had unlatched the window and climbed in. Investigators theorized that he heard Elaine's car coming or saw the headlights, hid behind the door, hit her with the lamp or fire poker when she walked in, then closed and relocked the door behind her. The blood trail showed that he dragged her from the door to the sofa where he removed her pants and underwear, pushed up her shirt and bra, and sexually assaulted her. Elaine's bedroom was also in a state of disarray and her tiny traumatized dog was found shaking uncontrollably under the bed. Investigators also found a pair of underwear on the couch next to Elaine, and other pairs of various styles of undergarments in her roommate's bedroom. Elaine's car was still in the driveway, but her keys were never found. Eventually, her bloody jeans turned up on the roof of the back porch. The killer had apparently left through the back door and tossed them on the roof before disappearing into the darkness. Investigators had a relatively clear picture of how the attack had played out, but a number of questions still remained. 
First, nobody knew if the perpetrator's main intent was to sexually assault Elaine. If not, she may have interrupted a burglary and the sexual assault may have been a crime of opportunity. Either way, the poker around her neck and injuries on her body left little doubt that the murder was intentional. That night and into the following morning, investigators analyzed and photographed the crime scene and collected evidence they hoped would eventually lead to the arrest of the killer. Later, the coroner observed deep abrasions and contusions on Elaine's hands, fingers, and knuckles, all of which were defensive in nature. In other words, she'd been conscious during some of the attack and had put up quite a fight. Ultimately, the coroner concluded that Elaine's death had been caused by severe head injuries and strangulation, and the fire poker was the primary weapon. To ensure that no stone was left unturned, Walter Burroughs Police Chief requested assistance from Colton County Sheriff's Office and from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, or SLED. At the time, SLED was a statewide investigative agency that provided manpower and technical services to local, state, and federal authorities investigating crimes committed in South Carolina. SLED initially sent a bloodhound team from Columbia, but by the time the dogs arrived, the crime scene had been so trampled by police officers and investigators that they were unable to pick up the attacker's scent. Even so, authorities felt confident that the fingerprints, palm prints, blood, hair, and fluid samples taken from the crime scene would lead them to the killer. While most samples went to the Medical University of South Carolina's forensic lab, the original 35mm film taken at the crime scene was sent to SLED where it was developed, cataloged, and analyzed. Shortly after discovering Elaine's body, the Walterboro Police Department contacted the Orangeburg Police Department to ask if they'd notify her parents. Orangeburg Officer Gene Brandt was at the station when the call came in. As a friend of Elaine's Aunt Miriam and Uncle Jimmy, he knew he'd have to deliver the heartbreaking news himself. He immediately drove to their home and told them what had happened. From there, they called their pastor and asked him to accompany them to the Fogel residence. When they arrived, Elaine's parents, her sister Yolene and her husband Larry, were already sound asleep. After being awakened by a startling knock at 3 a.m., Elaine's parents knew something was horribly wrong when they saw Officer Brandt, Miriam, Jimmy, and their pastor standing on the front porch. After processing the dreadful news, Elaine's mother pointed out that her daughter had been attacked, sexually assaulted, and murdered the day before her birthday. Worse yet, the murder weapon was the very fire poker they'd given her as a housewarming gift. During the autopsy, the medical examiner had to get help to unbend the fire poker from around Elaine's neck. It'd been wrapped so tightly that the handle's distinct crosshatch pattern was permanently abraded into her flesh. The same pattern was visible where she'd been struck on her left arm and hand. The medical examiner removed a small portion of pubic hair and took oral, vaginal, and rectal smear samples to test for the presence of semen. Both the vaginal and rectal results came back positive, proving that Elaine had been sexually assaulted before she was killed. The medical examiner also removed skin from under her fingernails, so the perpetrator probably had scratches, gouges, and lacerations on his face, head, neck, and arms. The medical examiner also noted that some of the tissue appeared to contain pigment. This meant that the killer may have been a person of color, but on the other hand, the hair samples taken from the crime scene were all from a Caucasian. Either way, the manner of death was clearly homicide and the killer was still on the loose. Investigators turned their attention to the people Elaine knew, worked with, and associated with. First, they contacted Elaine's employer, a prominent local physician named Dr. Flowers. He and his family were particularly distraught because they considered Elaine far more than just another employee. In fact, they trusted her enough to babysit their son, and Dr. Flowers described her as diligent, responsible, and likable. However, he was concerned that her keys were never found because he'd given her keys to the office. Because drug-related crimes had been on the rise in Walterboro, investigators thought the perpetrator might use the keys to break into Dr. Flowers' office and steal the medications that were stored on site. Another theory was that the attacker may have thought that Elaine had drugs in her home. However, that didn't make much sense because there was no indication that Elaine had ever stolen, used, or sold drugs. Either way, Dr. Flowers immediately changed the locks at his office and no link between his employees, patients, and Elaine ever materialized. 
Investigators also questioned Elaine's friends, family members, and former fiancé, but they didn't believe any of them had anything to do with her murder. Elaine was born in Orangeburg, South Carolina on December 15, 1951 to Wells and Murtis Fogel. As a child, she was a friendly and compassionate tomboy who loved painting and drawing, being outdoors, and spending time with her family and friends. After graduating from technical school in 1972, she moved to Walterboro to work as a laboratory assistant at Colton Regional Hospital. Elaine quickly made new friends and became active in the community, but she ultimately accepted a new position with Dr. Flowers. After getting settled into her new job, she began taking night classes at Baptist College in Charleston because she wanted to get her bachelor's degree. She also enrolled in a number of art courses because she also dreamed of becoming an accomplished artist one day. Elaine also had a strong faith and was heavily involved in clubs and activities at the Episcopal Church in town. By all accounts, 26-year-old Elaine was a happy and well-adjusted young woman with lots of friends, a close family, a good job, and a bright future. Rita Schuler's passion for photography and law enforcement took her professional career in a number of distinct directions. As a young woman, she worked as a radiologic technologist for 12 years. During that time, her interest in forensics grew and she assisted law enforcement officials by x-raying homicide victims' bodies. Then, in 1979, she fulfilled a lifelong dream by becoming a certified law enforcement officer and special agent with SLED's Forensic Photography Lab. At SLED, one of her primary responsibilities was assisting other local, state, and federal agencies. In many respects, it was Rita's dream job because she'd always had a strong sense of justice and liked helping people in need whenever she could. By then, she was already an experienced photographer, but she was thrilled that she'd be able to take additional courses at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Rita learned more than she could have imagined in Quantico, and her new knowledge only reinforced the belief that it was often forensic photographers working in relative obscurity who cracked the toughest cases. That said, SLED's photo lab wasn't particularly advanced in the late 70s when Elaine's case file wound up on Rita's desk. One thing that immediately struck her was how much she and Elaine looked alike. They also had similar taste in clothes. She knew right away it was going to be personal. After familiarizing herself with Elaine's case, Rita processed the film and printed photographs of the latent finger, palm, and shoe prints taken at the crime scene. Then, she pored over the images to see if she could find anything that investigators from the Walterboro Police Department had missed. Investigators initially compiled a list of locals with checkered pasts and criminal records. A number of suspects were interviewed and polygraphed, but they were all ultimately released. However, a 23-year-old man named Robert Allen remained at the top of the list of likely suspects. Ronald was an immensely strong 6-foot, 250-pound auto mechanic who lived with his wife, Fran, in a trailer just a stone's throw away from the house where Elaine was murdered. Ronald was definitely strong enough to bend a steel fire poker, and many of the officers and investigators working the case had dealt with him before. He was a drinker and a drug user with a violent temper, and unsurprisingly, his past was littered with assaults, burglaries, and DUIs. Once, Ronald stole a car in Michigan and led police on a high-speed chase into Ohio before officers cut him off and shot him in the neck. He recovered and did his time, but when Walter Burrow PD investigators stopped by to ask him if he knew anything about Elaine's murder, he said he didn't know her and that he'd never been in her house. Fran said that they'd both been asleep at home the night Elaine was killed. Then she told them that she'd seen a shirtless African-American man washing himself off with the hose in their backyard early the next morning. Investigators weren't sure if the story was true, but they took a boot and shoe that belonged to Ronald to check them against the prints taken from the crime scene. Unfortunately, neither matched the ones left by the killer, but Ronald's employer gave investigators something else to think about. He told them that Ronald had quit his job about a month before Elaine was killed. Then, the day before the murder, he showed back up and told him that he was considering buying a Ford Grand Torino on the lot. Ronald didn't end up buying the car, but the following morning it had mysteriously disappeared when the owner came in and opened up. The Grand Torino turned up in Tennessee shortly thereafter, and years later, Ronald Allen wound up in Tennessee too. Sadly, Elaine's father passed away two years after her murder. According to his family, he died of grief, and by the early 80s, the case had gone hopelessly cold. 
With nothing left to lose, Elaine's mother asked investigators if the story could be featured on the popular television program Unsolved Mysteries. However, they told her that the publicity might hinder their efforts, because they'd spend all their time chasing dubious leads called in by hoaxers and crackpots. Then, in early 1984, investigators got word that two inmates in state prison had information about the case and possibly even the identity of Elaine's killer. The prisoners did have intimate knowledge that hadn't been released to the public, but they either couldn't or wouldn't provide the name of the killer, and none of the information they passed along checked out. It wasn't until the late 80s SLED established an advanced profiling unit like the one featured in the 1991 blockbuster hit The Silence of the Lambs. Together, SLED and FBI agents created a profile to help investigators track down Elaine's killer. They determined that the perpetrator was probably a married white male between 24 and 30 years old with an extensive criminal record. There was also a high probability that he drank, used drugs, had problem with women and authority, and couldn't hold down a job for more than a month or two. In other words, someone just like Ronald Allen. But even with a likely suspect like Ronald, the case ground to such a halt that by 1991, nearly everyone had given up hope that Elaine's killer would ever be brought to justice. Then, one night in late November, Elaine's 65-year-old mother, Murtis, was awakened by a man's gruff voice outside her bedroom. She rose, peered out the window, and was instantly startled by a large black man staring back at her. She told him that she had a gun, and he said that he did too. Murtis found that her phone was dead when she ran to the kitchen to call 911, and seconds later, the man kicked in the front door, threw her to the floor, and threatened to rape her. She told him that she had AIDS to scare him off, and it worked. He got up, ransacked the house, and pocketed a little money and a handful of inexpensive jewelry. But before he went, he told her he'd come back and kill her if she didn't stay on the floor until he was long gone. Later, Murtis's niece took her to the Orangeburg County Sheriff's Department to report the incident. The perpetrator was never identified, but she always wondered if it was the same man who'd raped and killed her daughter. Like her father, Elaine's mother died in 1999 never knowing who killed her daughter. Rita Schuler retired from SLED in the fall of 2001 and the case lay dormant for a decade. Now with plenty of spare time on her hands, Rita decided to pursue another lifelong dream by becoming a writer. That was an exciting but daunting new chapter in her life because English had never been her best subject. To get the ball rolling, she began by doing what came naturally, chronicling the most unique and frustrating cases she worked during her time at SLED. Needless to say, the unsolved murder of Elaine Fogel was one of them. Elaine's case was more than two decades old at the dawn of the new millennium, but by then, SLED had a dedicated cold case division and national fingerprint and DNA databases were finally up and running. Investigators knew that the killer's fingerprints and DNA would have been entered into the database if he'd been arrested on other charges. Now with a glimmer of hope, evidence gathered at the crime scene was reanalyzed and run through various databases for matches. Investigators found out that Ronald Allen had moved to Tennessee, but he died before they could pay him a visit. An agent from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation informed them that he'd already been buried, but the medical examiner had drawn two vials of blood because he wasn't able to determine the cause of death during the autopsy. SLED investigators visited Ronald's home, talked to his family, and found a number of newspaper articles about Elaine's death in one of his dresser drawers. That was particularly eye-opening because killers often kept mementos of their crimes. However, no connection was ever established between Elaine Fogel and Ronald Allen. Now at yet another dead end, SLED investigators knew they needed a miracle to solve the case. Even retirement didn't stop Rita Schuler from working on the case, but she knew she had to get Elaine's family involved. She had never met or even spoken with them while working at SLED, but she wrote Elaine's sister, Yolene, a letter in 2007 in which she detailed her involvement in the case and expressed the deep personal connection she always felt to Elaine. When she got no response, Rita assumed that Elaine's family had come to terms with her death and just weren't interested in digging up such a painful chapter in their lives. Then, more than a month later, she got a letter from Yolene. She and the rest of the family appreciated all that Rita had done, and they were willing to do whatever they could to help. When they first met in person, Yolene was shocked at how much Rita and Elaine looked alike. Rita remembered thinking the same thing when she saw the crime scene photos for the first time. 
Eventually, the two became hard and fast friends, and Rita regularly attended family events like birthday parties and anniversary celebrations. Meanwhile, she wrote to officers and investigators who'd been involved in the case early on. Most responded, but nobody had anything new to add. Rita even connected with Elaine's old roommate, Nancy Hooker, and her friend, Billy O'Brien. But their stories hadn't changed either. Ironically, Rita didn't find out about SLED's cold case division until the spring of 2009. With nothing to lose, she immediately called and scheduled a meeting with Bo Barton and Natalie Crossland, both of whom she'd worked with before. Rita presented them with some new information she'd uncovered and reminded them that new technology in the National Fingerprint and DNA databases could blow the case wide open. They agreed, but Rita wasn't always in the loop because she had no official standing. Then one day she ran into Natalie Crossland at the grocery store. Natalie informed her that some of the original DNA samples taken from the crime scene had been resubmitted for additional forensic analysis. Natalie couldn't give her any specifics, but she said that the results could take the case in a promising new direction. Then, just when things were looking up, Rita found out that SLED's cold case division had been disbanded. Breaking the news to Elaine's family wasn't easy, but they weren't particularly surprised. They understood that most local and state police departments were understaffed and underfunded, and that 30-year-old cold cases just weren't priorities. Rita never gave up on solving Elaine's murder, but she eventually moved to the coast and focused on her writing. Then, in May of 2015, Yolene called with some remarkable news. She was just informed that the Walterboro Police Department had appointed a seasoned investigator to review Elaine's case file. Shortly thereafter, Rita picked up the phone and called Corporal Jean Johnson to ask what she could do to help. Corporal Johnson had only been 13 years old when Elaine was murdered, but he was just as passionate about the case as Rita was. During their short conversation, Rita made such a positive impression that he asked her if she'd like to join the investigation as a voluntary unpaid consultant. She jumped at the opportunity, but picking up where she left off wouldn't be easy. Since she and Corporal Johnson had a lot of catching up to do, they began by reviewing each report and poring over every statement to see if they could find anything that might have been overlooked. One thing that jumped out was that the original pathology report mentioned a number of semen swabs that hadn't been analyzed using the DNA isolation techniques that were developed years after the crime was committed. Worse yet, the samples may have been misplaced altogether. Luckily, a mixed DNA sample taken from the underwear found on the couch by Elaine's body had been resubmitted for additional analysis, and surprisingly, the results excluded Ronald Allen. Now with a bona fide DNA sample, Rita and Corporal Johnson went to see Elaine's old fiancé to see if it was his semen in Elaine's underwear. He told them that he was in Elaine's home frequently during their engagement and that his DNA was probably all over the place. But after consulting with an attorney, he agreed to provide a cheek swab and it proved that the semen wasn't his. Meanwhile, another series of promising tips began trickling in. One woman claimed that a shady local police officer had been interested in Elaine in the late 70s and that he'd abruptly moved to Florida shortly after her murder. Then two more tipsters mentioned the same police officer. Corporal Johnson tracked him down as well, but just like Ronald, he had recently passed away and no link to Elaine was ever established. Shortly thereafter, Billy O'Brien got a bizarre letter with a Georgia postmark. It contained a photo of Elaine that had been released by the press with a short note that said, quote, You know who this is. Do the right thing. Billy took the letter to the Walterboro Police Department and told Rita and Corporal Johnson that he had no idea what it meant, who sent it, or why. Billy also provided a cheek swab that came back negative against the male DNA from the crime scene. Later, Dr. Flower's son got a similar letter, but he was just as baffled as Billy O'Brien. In the end, investigators concluded that the letters had been sent by a hoaxer with too much free time on their hands. By August of 2015, Rita Schuler and Corporal Johnson had cleared every suspect, chased down every lead, and rechecked every report. Despite amazing advances in technology, the DNA evidence taken from the crime scene hadn't gotten them any closer to catching Elaine's killer. Instead of continuing down the same road, they decided to focus on latent finger and palm prints. Almost as an afterthought, an old colleague of Rita's ran a number of prints through APHIS, the FBI's integrated automated fingerprint identification system. 
Miraculously, one came back as a match for a 58-year-old African-American man named James Willie Butterfield. That was surprising because profilers assumed that the killer was white, but Willie had an arrest record dating all the way back to 1979, and Corporal Johnson had personally arrested him in 2002 for assaulting a female neighbor. The victim survived the attack and told investigators that Willie had threatened to kill her. On top of that, he also told her she wouldn't be the first woman he killed. Corporal Johnson couldn't track Willie down, but his sister told him that he had been found incompetent to stand trial after being charged with a serious crime, and that the judge sent him to a mental health facility in Columbia, South Carolina. Willie's fingerprints placed him at the scene of the crime, but any good defense attorney would argue that it didn't prove that he killed Elaine, or even that he was in the home the night she was sexually assaulted and murdered. What investigators needed was a sample of Willie's DNA. In early September of 2015, Corporal Johnson interviewed Willie at the mental health facility. Before getting started, he showed Willie a Miranda form and asked him to read and sign it. However, Willie claimed that he couldn't read or write. Corporal Johnson wasn't sure if he was telling the truth, but he read Willie his rights out loud and had him initial the form. During the interview, Willie claimed that he didn't know Elaine and that he'd never been in her house or even on her property, but he admitted that he did know her when Corporal Johnson informed him that his fingerprints were found in her home. Then the detective came right out and asked Willie why he did what he did to Elaine. Willie calmly responded, quote, I don't know. Luckily, Willie allowed Corporal Johnson to take a cheek swab right before asking for a lawyer and ending the interview. At about 10 a.m. on September 18th, Rita got a short text from Johnson. It read, quote, We got a match on Butterfield. Call you later. Willie Butterfield willingly gave up a cheek swab, but since he'd been deemed incompetent by a court, it would be challenged and possibly thrown out if the case ever went to trial. What they needed was a sample of Willie's DNA that had been taken before he was declared incompetent. Luckily, they tracked down a sample from 2010, before the arrest that landed him in the mental health facility. On October 22, 2015, Corporal Johnson and Rita got the results they'd been hoping for. It was Willie Butterfield's DNA in Elaine's underwear. Now the investigators had matches for Willie's fingerprints and DNA, but the district attorney prohibited them from sharing the news with Elaine's family until all the legal issues had been addressed. In the end, Willie was charged with burglary, criminal sexual conduct, and murder. In early December, Corporal Johnson contacted Yolene and told her that they wanted her and her family to meet him and Rita at the Walterboro Police Department. On the way, Rita bought two red roses. The atmosphere was tense and emotionally charged as everyone sat around the big table in the police department's conference room. Everyone felt it. Something big was finally about to happen. Since he was the lead investigator, Corporal Johnson told everyone that Elaine's killer had been charged and arrested. After the sobs subsided, Rita gave both roses to Yolene. She said one was for her and the other was for her beloved sister. On December 3rd, the local paper ran a long overdue story with the headline, Man Charged in 1978 Murder of Orangeburg Native. A judge ordered Willie to remain in the mental health facility until the trial, but he also ordered another psychiatric evaluation. Meanwhile, a preliminary hearing was held in March of 2016 to determine if there was enough evidence to proceed with a criminal trial. On the stand, Corporal Johnson told the court how the case had developed over the previous 30-plus years. He also said that Willie Butterfield's name had been on a list of potential suspects early on but that no link was ever established until the National Fingerprint and DNA databases were online years later. Willie wasn't present at the preliminary trial, but Rita, Corporal Johnson, and Elaine's family couldn't have been any happier when the judge ruled that there was enough evidence for a criminal trial. Later, Willie refused to cooperate with the psychiatrist tasked with evaluating his mental state. The public defender argued that he wasn't being uncooperative, but that he was incapable of understanding what was happening and answering the questions the psychiatrist asked. Nonetheless, the judge ordered another evaluation, and that time, the psychiatrist found him incompetent to stand trial. He also noted that the chances of Willie ever being competent were slim. Now, instead of a criminal trial, the judge had little choice but to remand him to the mental health facility indefinitely. Sadly, he also ordered that the charges against Willie be dismissed, but he made it clear that they'd be refiled if his mental state ever improved. 
The ruling was a bitter pill for Rita, Corporal Johnson, and Elaine's family, but at the very least, Willie would either die in the mental health facility or one day stand trial for the heinous crime he committed all the way back in 1978. Despite not getting justice for the sexual assault and murder of Elaine, at the very least, a violent monster was off the streets, likely for good. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.